we've come to the end of the semester and before we're completely done, I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about machine learning and using it in, in larger contexts and, and then bring that back to the kinds of things that we've been talking about during the, the semester. The, the first point of advice is making sure that you always know what problem you're trying to deal with and know your data. So what are you trying to solve? What questions are you trying to answer with your data? Understanding what the different components of your data really mean. And, and it's, it's also important for, you, for us to understand what the, the costs are for collecting data or pre-processing data or even uh, labeling data. Likewise, and this is really part of the question uh, side of things, when we're making predictions, sometimes it really doesn't matter whether when we're making errors, whether those are false negatives or false positives. In other scenarios, especially when lives are at risk, it makes sense for us to make only one kind of error. And so under, understanding that aspect of, of your problem is really important. As far as knowing your data goes, as far as knowing data goes, things like what do your uh, feature vectors mean? Uh, and what do the individual features mean? So what, what are the distributions uh, look like? Do the features correlate with one another? Do the features correlate with a thing that you're trying to predict? Are the features continuous or are they enumerated or do you have some sort of mixture of, of both within your feature vector? And then understanding how much data you have now and, and how much data you can get your hands on in, in whatever time frame that you're working on uh, your project in. in. In all of these, it's really important to spend time uh, visualizing your data up front, even before you start to engage your machine learning uh, algorithms. And th this step is, is really very important from the perspective of understanding your data, but uh, this is also a, a, a step where you might discover that the data are not formatted the way you expect them, the, them to be, or the data might be uh, corrupted. And, and if you don't, do those kinds of fundamental checks, you can end up in scenarios where you spend a lot of time throwing algorithms at data uh, only to discover that the, the fundamental problems are just, are just in the data itself. It's also important for you to know what problem you're actually trying to uh, solve. And in that context, is this a supervised learning problem? Is it an unsupervised learning problem? Or is it something in between? Likewise, what kinds of predictions are we trying to make? Are we dealing in a continuous world? Are we trying to uh, predict probabilities or are we trying to predict class labels? And then the next kinds of questions to, to be asking are what, what are the right approaches to be addressing your data with? And, and how you make this choice, this is something that, that's going to come with experience. Hopefully this semester you, you've at least uh, begun to scratch the surface enough to understand uh, what things to start trying uh, in, in various kinds of uh, situations. But fundamentally, this choice comes down to what do your data look like and what kinds of predictions are you trying to make? You always really want to be starting out by trying out those simple approaches. So these are typically the ones that are quick to implement. And if you're lucky and the data are in the right form, then uh, this actually might be the solution that, that solves the problem uh, to an adequate degree. Whether or not it is, uh, either way you've, you've learned a lot about your, your data and the nature of the problem that you've, you're trying to solve. So you can kind of think about the, the full machine learning process kind of falling into this set of three bullets here. Uh, up front, we're doing a lot of work by hand. We're, we're trying those first few uh, solutions. We're doing some hand tuning of hyperparameters. And, and going through that process is really important because it really starts to help us get to the point where we have the data formatted properly. We, we're using the right kinds of representations. Uh, and perhaps we even start to narrow in on what the right types of, what, what the right values for our hyperparameters might be. With grid search and cross-validation, this is the much more computationally involved step, uh, but it is uh, much more formal and it's a very important uh, one. So with the grid search, this is where we're systematically testing lots of different hyperparameter uh, options. 
we've talked about this idea of uh, first trying to do a very broad and coarse search. Uh, and then once we start to understand the nature of that hyperparameter space, then narrowing that uh, search region down and, and doing a much finer search. So you might end up doing two or three uh, layers of grid search uh, as you're ho homing in on the right hyperparameter set. Cross-validation allows us to become much more formal in our statistical comparisons. So with our validation data sets, we're using statistical tools in order to compare our hyperparameter choices. Once it's time to report results or to compare a couple of different models, uh, that's the point where we're using our, our test data sets. But one has to be careful there about our multiple comparisons uh, problem. We've talked a lot over the semester about overfitting, and this is something that has come up in your homework assignments. And fundamentally, overfitting is about a mismatch between the training set size and the number of parameters that we're actually trying to choose. Overfitting is always something that you want to be looking at no matter what method you're actually uh, using. And, and this is the step where you're actually going to be doing that sensitivity analysis where you're varying the training set size and looking at that validation set performance. And if that performance is changing dramatically, then, then you don't have enough data uh, or you don't have your hyperparameters uh, set properly. You have that, an overfitting problem. In contrast, if uh, you're varying your training set size and validation set performance isn't changing, then that suggests that you have plenty of training data. Many of the machine learning methods that we studied this semester actually have mechanisms built into them to actually address uh, overfitting. So, so things like ridge regression or lasso uh, had hyperparameters that were all about uh, trying to express uh, regularization terms so that we would end up with much smoother uh, kinds of uh, functions. Other methods that we've studied, things like the linear regression uh, class, those don't have any mechanisms built directly in and we have to be very careful about how we use those. We've talked over the course of the semester about uh, distance metrics and similarity metrics. Euclidean distance turns out to really be at the center of many of the machine learning algorithms that we've studied, especially those that deal exclusively in continuous spaces. But as we've discussed, this particular metric is not particularly meaningful when we start to get into very high dimensional spaces. And, and this is the step where we start to uh, engage other kinds of uh, tools. So, so in these high dimensional spaces, the, the true distribution of uh, possible samples doesn't actually uniformly live within this space, but actually collapses onto much lower dimensional manifolds. And, and so, so engaging uh, tools such as principal component analysis or locally linear embedding out to isomap and TSNE, uh, these are all about uh, trying to capture in different ways the, the manifolds that are uh, sitting out in our feature spaces. PCA, of course, is an exclusively linear method, and, and these other methods are actually allowing us to get to more nonlinear kinds of representations. Some of the methods that we actually studied during the course of the semester really don't even look at the full feature space all at once. So our decision trees, our regression trees, or forests of these trees, the question nodes that are built into these trees are looking at individual features uh, at, at once, and, and hence they don't uh, tend to suffer uh, in the same way from this Euclidean distance uh, problem. They, of course, still can overfit our, our data sets, uh, so we have to take other kinds of steps to prevent that from happening. At some point during the course of your machine learning project, uh, you have to explain your results to either a customer or a supervisor. And depending upon what that, the background of that person is, they may or may not care about the low-level details of the methods that you're using or the hyperparameters that you've chosen. And, and really, in, in either case, you really need to be ready to talk about the, the high level of your analysis. And only drop into those low-level details if, if they're uh, relevant to the conversation.
as part of that conversation, you should uh, show raw data, you should show intermediate results, and you should show uh, more aggregate kinds of data. It's also really important uh, to be honest about what is working and what is not working in, in your uh, approach. So it's, it's very tempting to cherry pick results and show training set performance, but really when you're presenting to a live person or you're writing about uh, your results, it's really important to uh, present test set performance and explicitly state that that's what you're showing. In any of the writing that we do in, in my lab, we, as part of that process, we will actually show specific examples of here, here is an input into a, uh, a model and here's the prediction that it, that it makes. And we will show both uh, examples where it gets the predictions correct and other examples where it makes incorrect predictions. And, and this allows us to make an argument about how well this model is doing and it helps us point to the next steps that we should be taking in order to uh, improve the, the behavior of our models. As part of this argument that you're making, it's also really important to make uh, clear statistical arguments. So, so this is where you're bringing to bear things like your t-tests or your bootstrapping kinds of tests uh, as you're comparing one model against another or you're even making an argument that your model is actually predicting something important. For that kind of a step, you might have to do a little bit of education to, for your customer or your supervisor, but it's, it's a really uh, important to, to talk about how that model is performing and even if you have to make uh, define what uh, a p-value is. So this takes us to the, the end of our, our semester in, in total. Thank you very much for uh, coming along on this adventure and I, I hope these tools that we've been learning over the course of the semester uh, serve you well in the work that you're doing in the future.